Good afternoon. My name is Carl Weaver. I am a Greater China Wireless Market Specialist. I've dedicated my entire professional career to developing Greater Chinese markets in the, the emerging Pacific century. I've spent a decade of my career living and working in Taiwan. I've spent 20 years of my career focusing again as well on the Greater China, on the main, mainland Chinese markets. To this afternoon's presentation, and by the way, I live in Seattle, yes, um, uh, but I'm originally from Massachusetts. Um, this afternoon's presentation will be the global smartphone revolution, which seems to have evolved. Um, anyway, and also China is selling to the mobile digital dragon. So today's agenda will discuss the global smartphone revolution, concept of converged devices, smartphones, what their impact is on the global mobile society, and future mobile trends and the features of that. The second part that we'll focus on is China's impact, how China is impacting the mobile device revolution around the world, and also selling, a lot of selling into the mobile digital dragon. I term China the mobile digital dragon. We'll discuss market trends, the subtle art of doing business, some strategies and tactics, and a conclusion in uh, a Q&A. So basically, the global smartphone revolution um, is about mobile devices and how they are changing the way people do business in the United States and in China. So for the first part, we'll discuss a little bit about the US market and how that influences the Chinese market. Um, the, starting, the starting point of mobility, though, is very, very different in the United States and Europe and the greater Chinese markets. It's very, very different. Smartphones and quote-unquote converged devices, uh, they're going to be demanded by a global mobile society. Essentially, what you have now uh, is the global mobile society looking for integrated tasks, duties, wireless voice and data communications. It all essentially equals the mobile internet. So, what is a wireless converged device? I like to get around and get close to the product. So what's a wireless converged device? Is it a cell phone, PDA, personal digital assistant, data messaging device? By the way, if you watch Duncan with the SMS messaging, wow, he's a pro. Anyway, so with these wireless converged devices, if you take them and consolidate them all together, essentially that's what, that's what a smartphone is meant to do. And by the way, a smartphone is meant to be used with one hand, even if you're doing SMS messaging. Now, when, it, when is convergence successful? Typically when it's better combined, combined mm. and separated. Nobody wants to carry, although if Duncan has it before, nobody wants to carry so many of these mobile devices on their body or their pockets, no matter how big belts you have. Um, so very often, there's a space savings issue with these mobile, with these mobile devices. Um, also, when, if there's no or little compromise in how you use them, usability, talk is talk. End is end. Should be standard across the board with all of these devices. And finally, it actually makes uh, things simpler. It's just like software now. Who reads a manual anymore? It's all what you see is what you get, and everything should be very interactive. Um, so, with these mobile devices, it should be very easy to use right out of the box. Okay, so converged devices. These aren't anything new. We're using converged devices all the time. Think of the IBM computer, 1982, when it came out. Did it have a CD-ROM? Did it have a hard disk? And a floppy, which is now almost like an ancient item to be put on a computer. But essentially, look at the Swiss Army knife. That is a converged device that we are all using. Some people, they, um, they're skeptical of converged devices. I say there's no need to be skeptical, skeptical of converged devices. Um, there were many design failures with these mobile devices in the beginning. Technology enables. They simply weren't there five years ago. They are there now. It will advance some technology on the mobile side of business. Um, and it makes for complex, if it makes for a complex user experience, get it. It's just not going to be used. Uh, and when there's no clear customer design, uh, customer ID, think of the MD. Fantastic for the Japanese. They're sitting in traffic for hours and hours you know, on a subway. You know, sometimes standing. And now they can listen to their mobile device. They can now play with their mobile device. And in the past, with the MD, they could uh, listen to music um, for hours and hours. We don't do that in the States. We drive. We typically drive back and forth to the office. But in Asia, where the mobility and the portability is very, very different, that's where you see the demand. Um, did the MD sell here in, in, uh, in uh, Western Europe? 
I don't see too many people using them. Maybe, maybe a few. Now, mobile device convergence. Platform design features functions. Right now, today, you still have low-end, although getting higher, cell phones. Typically black and white, but now even more common color screens. In fact, it's tough to find a low-end handset now that doesn't have a color screen. But just a year or two ago, there's still a lot of black and white. And then you have PDA devices. PDA device is not a smartphone. A PDA device is a PDA device. It, it includes PIM, Personal Information, information Management um, Data. Smartphone combines all of these together. Smartphone typically has a, has a unique operating system. Microsoft, o, uh, Microsoft uh, OS, uh, Smartphone OS, or Symbian, or Palm, or Linux. And actually, even Samsung, Motorola, Nokia, they even have their, all, their own operating systems. But typically, there, there is somewhat of a commoditization even of the OS in the market. And it's Microsoft against Symbian, essentially. Palm thrown in there for good luck. And the Chinese <laughs> are going after um, uh, Linux because it's very, very low cost. But uh, there will be a surge in demand for digital cameras in the handsets as well. Uh, basically, I've, list, I've shown a few of them here. Um, PDAs, you use two hands with. You take it from the ear, it's, a, it's an evolution from, from listening with, uh, in the ear to actually using it right in front of you. Whereas the smartphone, you're still going to use with one hand, um, and that includes all the functions. So even sending SMS messages with one hand. I'm not very savvy with SMS messages, I'm from the United States. So there is a need for smartphones. Where is there a need? Look at personalized ringtones. You know, with a smartphone, you can download your funky MP3 uh, songs that you want, play them back as ringtones. Right now, you can do that on, on, with, a, with smartphones. And you can also, um, of course, download MP3 uh, files and listen to them if you're not uh, making phone calls. There's a lot, of, a lot of interactive games that are going to be coming out. Now, Microsoft and Real Networks, both Seattle companies, these companies are fighting left, I mean, in fact, they're suing day and night. Um, for who's going to control the streaming media on the mobile device? Who's going to be who's going to control that? Is it going to be real the real player, or is it going to be Microsoft's media player? These things actually um, are going on right now. Now, um, maybe one day I'll be able to watch the Mariners uh, winning World Series uh, on, on my mobile device. That will be a real interesting concept if it happens. Anyway, there's an ease of use uh, issue here. And uh, rich SMS and MMS experiences can be obtained with smartphones because the software really, really pays close attention to creating a user experience. Don't expect the carriers to do that because that's not, they, they don't do that. Now, voice command software is coming out new. Uh, a new. A new function is coming out in, um, well, the Microsoft uh, smartphone OS has this new voice command. Um, some of the, yeah, the voice command can either be from the database or it can be from the mobile device. There's either a database only within the handset, which gives you limited functionality, or, da or uh, some, uh, voice commands from a central database in the carrier's network. Um, but with all these smartphone devices, not one size fits all. It's, it's, for many people, it's going to be a, um, an impulse buy, actually. All right, let's move on. So we have a situation where you have play and work, and then you've got your whole life, but uh, your, your, your lifestyle. But actually, they're all intermingling. They're merging together. And the reason is because lifestyles are converging between work and play. It's because mobility. We want to be more, more mobile in whatever we do. We want to be able to talk to our, our friends, even, on, even at work, at play, wherever we go. Even if we roam across, halfway across the world. Now, people at, um, at work are people who work at home. And they use their mobile devices or their landline phones. That's been going on for a while. Uh, a lot of people have small offices. I have a small office, home office, so people also do personal things at work. Sometimes they use their cell phone to pay a bill online. Uh, they'll, they'll pay a bill. They can do it wirelessly. Uh, they can do it uh, using their credit card and phone. Um, but there's a social impact of this convergent lifestyle. There is a social impact. I know people who sleep with their mobile device. They never turn the thing off. This is true. Um, is it right or is it wrong? What's the impact? There is an impact. Sometimes. You men who work too often in the office, you may ask your wife what the impact is of using these phones too often. Your wife, your wife may want to hide it from you. But actually, that is the situation. So the next generation of mobile society workers, they're already adopt the early adopters of this new lifestyle. That's what the carriers are going after, the youth crowd. Okay, 
So converged devices, they do attract the youth. Nokia is uh, coming up with a real funky line of products. This is actually from a company in California called Danger Inc. That's called the Sidekick. Um, T-Mobile in the United States, and I think, I don't know if it's sold in, in Europe yet, but T-Mobile has been promoting this about a year, year or so. But if you notice the funky devices, now, what's interesting is, is if, you're, if, you're, if you're of a certain age group, you're simply going to look at that and say, I'm never going to buy that thing. What? It's just too crazy. But the youth of this, of this world, they get it. They want all the functionality that you can get from these new mobile devices. So, um, the wireless carriers are looking to increase their R pool, and uh, from the consumer side of the, of the market, that seems to me to be a very good strategy to capture um, uh, revenues uh, around the world. It's not just in China, it's, it's in the United States, it's not just in the United States, it's in Europe as well. But there's an enterprise issue. Now Microsoft is really playing with their smartphone uh, devices, converged devices. They're really playing to the enterprise side of business. Uh, mobility with uh, with converged devices. So they really, when you look at that, they're looking to um, uh, they're looking to PIM the personal information um, to, uh, for mobile applications for the business side of the users. There's vertical and there's some horizontal applications, and also voice activation and security. These are going to be killer apps for the mobile and the mobile for the mobile business profession. They're coming. They are coming. Um, these are just some of the more um, some of the newer designs. Does anybody know who Sendo is? You know that's a UK company? Yes. They were actually supposed to come with the first Microsoft smartphone uh, in the world. That was over, over a year and a half ago. Uh, then Microsoft sued them, they sued Microsoft. And, and uh, well, it's, it's very interesting that Microsoft invests as a is one of the investors in Sendo. So anyway, Nokia's got some new mobile devices. That's a really nice Samsung, the i i600, very, very nice. If you're on the CDMA network or the GSM network, this is one of the best smartphones, um, at least for the CDMA, CDMA side. Sprint is promoting that right now. Um, this is the first um, smartphone, quote unquote, in the United States with Microsoft's smartphone OS. And um, Sony Ericsson has a funky, a nice funky device there as well. But as you can see, um, these are the new, newer smartphones, very converged devices that are appearing in the market. A lot of people still don't know what a smartphone is, but it is all about integration and integrating more and more functions and features. Now, I want to shift the focus to a little bit on messaging services to, you know, which will grow rapidly. And yes, I understand. A, for in Asia, SMS is a very proven revenue generator right now. But MMS is coming. And, you know, in fact, in the United States, we were really somewhat laggards when it comes to um, setting up SMS messaging. But, you know what? That situation is changing and changing rapidly in the United States. The youth and the business users are starting to send SMS messaging. They're starting to use MMS messaging. at and Wireless is uh, M mode program. Um, they have these um, programs and they're going to continue with these programs because they need to increase ARPU just like uh, China needs to increase ARPU. Every carrier needs to increase ARPU and they are looking at content and uh, new interactive games and things like um, typical content that you would see to improve, improve revenue, um, especially in China, of our icons, ringtones, jokes, and actually put in the Wall Street Journal pornography, but yeah, China, it's commerce, so um, are you going to really stop it? I think not. But the, basically, dating services is really hot now in China. Um, online gaming is very big. So SMS is a proven revenue generator. You might look at that and say, well, India, believe it, India's coming up strong. Uh, in Japan and then China. That's the rest of the world. Now, camera phones, they all, they're going to drive revenues, but you know, uh, camera phones actually have a security issue. And you know, in China, they're all about security. So, um, Actually, if you go into a uh, health bar in, the, in America, they're going to stop you and ask you, do you, have a, do you have a camera phone? In addition to camera phones, it's, uh, there's a funky new term called camcorder phone. Which is really kind of an evolutionary term to video uh, to a, you know, having a video phone, but camcorders typically store MPEG four video, usually ten to thirty seconds up to perhaps a minute. But remember, you're you're you're, you're storing um, video now. There's a lot of compression needed in order to to do that. But basically, the the uh, Nokia thirty six sixty 
They're just expecting very nice handset. Does a, a, it's a camera phone. Stores uh, JPEGs. Also stores um, uh, small video for a few minutes, a minute or so, I guess. Anyway, if you look here, you can see camera phone market. It's set to continue. It's set to double. It's, it's going. The situation right now is a camera phone. The camera can be put in the phone. It can be put into any other device, not just a camera. So the camera is just the is just one uh, method of getting a camera or into uh, in, for mobility. But there will be more things that will be co converged into your mobile device in the future. Um, the camcorder function, as I say, um, camcorder phones are going to be very very strong um, in year 2004. And um, actually, I just bought a, a smart uh, another smartphone, and when you use the camera, when you click. You hear the sound. That's going to be a, probably a requirement um, all over the world to be able to hear when you're being uh, photographed, essentially. It is important. It's a security issue. Now, um, Bluetooth. Bluetooth is a replacement for wires, obviously. Bluetooth, there was a lot of hype last year of Bluetooth. Bluetooth costs a little bit more to put into the mobile devices, but I believe year 2004, Bluetooth is going to have huge demand. That camcorder right there has Bluetooth. Um, there's a concept right now called blue jacking, where when you're inside of a, uh, a 30 foot range, one person has a Bluetooth device, maybe his girlfriend's on the other side and they're sitting into a class, into a class listening to somebody like me, wants to send a real quick note to his friend right across the room, there you go, you can instantly send a Bluetooth. Because what is Bluetooth? Bluetooth does a lot of things. It's a, it's a replacement for wires, it works as a wireless earpiece. Jabber has a very nice wireless earpiece uh, device out there now. Costs about 100 bucks US. Um, that is the way of the future. But also this blue jacket where you can, it's, a, it's a wireless personal area, personal area network. And you can send a message from one side of the room to the other. So Bluetooth is coming on strong. And the Toyota Prius comes as an option with Bluetooth. Expect that in more and more of the cars. And in fact, I think the Japanese have been promoting that. Every Sony, most Sony Ericsson phones, all the smartphones from Sony Ericsson have Bluetooth. Capability. So I look for it into more and more mobile devices this year. It's tough to get. Um, I, I've, I've talked to like people like Panda and told them if you have Bluetooth, you can add more value into your mobile devices. There is a cost issue related to adding Bluetooth into these mobile devices, but I think it's going to be standard uh, this year in a lot of the mobile devices that I see coming on the market. Now, this is the U.S. carriers. Well, you know about the U U U.K. carriers. Let me tell you a little bit about the U.S. carriers. Basically, um, there's a TDMA and GSM situation with AT&T Wireless, um, Singular, uh, T-Mobile. Uh, on the CDMA side, you've got Sprint, US Cellular, and Verizon. Now, Verizon technically introduced the first um, quote-unquote 3G network into the US market late last year. But what's really interesting to note is there's a small company, again, I'm always going to promote Washington State companies if I can, a small company called Monet Mobile Networks. They're in Kirkland. They have 3G in rural America, so it's, you know, what do you need 3G in rural America for? Well, they have it, and they've had the network up for a year or so now. Um, but in general, for 3G, um, the migration for from 1XRTT for at least for um, <coughs> at least for Verizon's EBDB. Now, Sprint has mentioned that they will go to EB, um, they will go to EBDDO, but EBDB, I think there's still some contention from Sprint whether they're going to do that or not. But the bottom line here is that there's new frequency allocation now in the United States for 3G. In fact, you know, the U.S. was, was behind in, uh, in wireless technologies um, in the early, late, late, um, late in 2000, I think. But the U.S. has now come back, especially the carriers. There's, there's, a, there's a demand now in the United States um, for all of these services and these 3G networks. There is demand for 3G. Now, I want to focus a little bit now on... Um, uh, the mobile digital dragon. This will be this will be mainly China. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about the trends. You know, China, as you know, has 265 or 60 or, or 55, somewhere in that range. If you if you count SIM cards or you count handsets, about 260 million subscribers in China, and that's huge, largest in the world. Um, we'll discuss about the usage of the mobile, um, of the wireless mobile internet, which is really what we're talking about. These converged smartphone devices are the mobile internet. We'll talk about uh, 2.5 3G, um, Bluetooth, wireless LAN, as they apply to the handset, um, SMS and MMS, a little bit more, and a little bit more about the uh, camera phones. But these are the trends now that I see in China. 
Um, but yeah, completely going off the chart. It's continuing to go off the chart. And this is why small and medium-sized companies should be focusing on the Chinese market. Just don't, don't deny it. The situation is China's there as a market, so how do you sell to the Chinese? Well, I'll come up with some strategies that I have, I have used and I have um, deployed um, to access and enter the Chinese markets. Um, mobile phone users, as, as Duncan has mentioned, uh, now they now are more than the fixed line. It's really interesting, kind of put in more fiber in the past decade than anybody else in the world as well. China's internet portals, uh, they're profiting. So basically, SMS is fueling growth. Uh, the three major carriers is very, very low cost. It's a shema, sh uh, uh, to, um, to send an SMS or a little bit less than that now. But you can broadcast that message all over. So if you, if you go to China, if you watch the youth of China and people sending SMS uh, messages, you'll find that they feel so comfortable with this one hand just at their side, sending this message. I saw a duck do it. It's amazing. Just one finger you know, <laughs> to do this SMS message. It's like, wow. It's the evolution. Uh, it really is the evolution of voice to that, and it, it, it requires extra skills. Now, um, last Chinese New Year, about 8 billion during the seven, year, uh, seven day time frame, 8 billion SMS messages were sent. So it is a proven revenue gener generator. It's going to continue to improve. Um, uh, but I believe that MMS messaging, because the camera phone, the camcorder phone, uh, have now been added to the smartphone um, uh, functionality, this is what's going to drive MMS messaging, I, I feel. Now, I'd like to talk about the Greater China integration strategy that, as I perceive it, basically, Greater China is leading in the technology for mobile device markets. Why do I say that? Well, Taiwan is the source for R&D and financing. One of those companies that Duncan mentioned, DBTEL, it's a Taiwanese company. They have bought, uh, they, they have a license and they bought my Motorola's factory, I think in year 2000, to produce uh, handsets. So they, they have a license to produce handsets in China. Uh, DBTEL is known as a Chinese company, but it's actually a Taiwanese company. Um, so it's 50% from my perception and my analysis and my research. 50% of all the cell phones are actually designed in Taiwan. Why do I say that? Because the Japanese are designing in Taiwan, in cooperation with the Taiwan. Then they're taking the product into Taiwanese control factories in China to do the assembly. Flextronics is using Taiwan. Selectron, um, the, the contract manufacturers that are using Taiwan. Everyone is using Taiwan for the R&D. Taiwan is the, is the world's premier destination for the R&D of these mobile devices. Now, it has been mentioned about uh, the Chinese 28th month to reuse a mobile device. And most of those devices are now going into the hinterland. And um, do people in the hinterland know how to use these mobile devices? Sometimes no. But guess what? They're still buying. Why? Same reason why they have diamonds on the handset for TCL, which, by the way, they, they order from time. The reason is because these mobile devices are there. There's a branding issue. These mobile devices are are a status symbol in China. Even if you know Mr. Wong, who's 80 years old, doesn't know how to how to you know, make a phone conversation. Doesn't matter, he's got the mobile device, people can see it. It's a status symbol. The Chinese are just as status conscious as anybody else in the world. Now, let's talk about the Chinese handset manufacturers. They absolutely must, if they want to increase ARPU and not go out of business, they must migrate to the smartphone, and that's exactly what's happening. That's what's uh, happening. Nokia, Sony Ericsson, CEC, Telecom, Samsung, Panda, Ningbo Bird, They've introduced smartphones into China. More players will come on. Um, Microsoft just uh, would just love to work with them, uh, but the problem is, is I don't believe this design works well for China. I believe the Chinese want a flip phone. They hang, like the Japanese. They hang it around the neck. They hang it around the neck. That's what they want to do. Um, Chinese have traditionally smaller hands than people in the West, um, and these are really, really big. Uh, this is basically an orange is selling this, right? Um, it's really, really big. And in China, Dopo Da, the Chinese they call it, Dopo, this is basically HTC, working with a partner in China to get the design that Microsoft gave the software. And using Microsoft software, HTC, which is a big Taiwanese company, HTC makes all the iPads, and they make all of these smartphones that are proliferating um, with this particular design. Microsoft's working with a bunch of partners in Taiwan, HTC, Inventec, Compel, a few other players, 
And then basically, uh, and HTC is essentially taking this particular design to China and trying to sell it. Uh, again, as I said, the Chinese consumers want, they want flip phone. Maybe some will buy the quote unquote the candy bar. That's, a, that's, that's more like a baby roof. That's, that's not quite a candy bar. It's, it's huge. It's got a big, big screen here. Um, and uh, the Microsoft um, OS, it's, it's got the Chinese support as well. It's about uh, $543. You might be asking. People in China, can they afford that? Yes, they can. They're buying it. Now, real quickly about Wyland in China. Um, there are more than half of all uh, bus spots are, are in Asia. Now, Starbucks is leading, let's go to the next one here. Starbucks is leading um, in the implementation in the United States with, with T-Mobile. And uh, in China, they've got about a quarter to the Starbucks fellow that I spoke to in Seattle. They've got about 119 stores in China now. That's amazing. Um, and about half of them are now wi Wi-Fi. I'm sure Dr. Paul uses this, goes to Starbucks now. Okay. No, <laughs> okay, anyway, um, Starbucks in China, about half of those Starbucks are Wi-Fi enabled. Uh, they're working with their Hong Kong affiliate to work with the carriers <laughs> in China. Um, Wi-Fi uh, systems are expected to grow. Now, as the um, Forbidden City, I don't think you're going to see Pui ordering a cup of coffee anytime soon, but um, that's not worth trying. But um, the bottom line is, is that Wi-Fi is going into China, and um, we'll talk a little bit more about the WAPI, uh, WAPI encryption protocol, which they're calling the state secret. That's what they're calling it. But let's move on to 3G migration landscape. This kind of could be very political. Uh, basically, I call it World War 3G. You've got the migration from GSM to WCMA for, quote unquote, the European protocol, the Euro European standard for 3G. The Americans with the CMA uh, and, C and 1, uh, 1XRTT migrated to EVDV and EVDO eventually. Then you've got TDS CMA. Like, like Duncan, I, I, would, I, would, uh, I agree that um, actually Siemens has been pushing this just as heavily as Data. I believe Siemens has 11% of the IP. Uh, for this technology, and I think Datan only has 9%. So I wouldn't say that Datan is ha unhappy with Siemens. I believe that Siemens looked at Huawei and decided that Huawei is a much more powerful um, uh, organization to work with to promote uh, this technology globally. So maybe that's the reason why Siemens is uh, uh, working with Huawei to try to promote TDS Siemens. I believe that the Chinese are very nationalistic. And I believe whenever they can try to promote their standards around the world, they're going to do it. Now, I made a prediction um, uh, a number of months ago that um, uh, the, the, this year, or year, two, year 2004, China will release its frequencies. And of course, they've delayed. And of course, it doesn't look right for them to have frequencies until year 2005. Um, I predict that perhaps, it's almost a given, actually. That, that WCMA will go to China Mobile, or, uh, the uh, CMA 2000, China Unicom. TDS CMA, it's very possible that the Netcom and uh, China Telecom will get licenses. Um, but Siemens with this new Huawei alliance at that time, they will, uh, they will continue to lead in the development of TDS CMA. Uh, my viewpoint is, is that if the Chinese want this to be a standard, they will try to influence the world. China is now trying to influence the world with its standards. Guess what? We have to take that into strong consideration. I believe we do. Um, and that's least, this leads to my next slide, which is the new Chinese technology standards. Look what's going on. Uh, TDS CMA for the uh, third generation mobile communications. I've never known the Chinese to spend money foolishly. Have you? I believe that they want to promote this, and I, I do believe this is going to be reality and one carrier is going to be using this technology. And um, I believe that Huawei is a good vehicle to sell this technology globally. I guess it's a different paradigm. It's almost like a paradigm shift and a different mindset to look at China as number one, which is what I do. Is that you have um, all the initiative and aggressiveness to try to interface, deal, and sell to the Chinese. Um, the enhanced versatile disk in the EVD format here. China's trying to influence uh, this as well. Uh, the Chinese YLAN standard. This has gotten a lot of players, ups, uh, a lot of um, uh, access point players upset in the, in the West. 
uh, because it, it looks to me and to a lot of people like China is trying to influence the global Wi-Fi scam. Are they doing it? Can they do it? Just note this. Most of the Wi-Fi access points are either designed or assembled in Taiwan and China. So by, by the sure virtue that um, most of this equipment is designed and manufactured in the Far East and in China, I think that they can influence this, um, this quote unquote security protocol, it's wacky, uh, it's a funky term, wacky protocol. That's, that's just my uh, personal opinion. Now, Hutch has had a tremendous problem getting this 3G uh, up and running. Uh, this particular uh, device here, I think, we, I think these are selling right now in the UK. I don't see too many papers on it. Um, they're also selling this um, NEC phone. I actually uh, spoke to Hutch, people at Hutch just uh, about a week ago. And I think this is being replaced. I don't, I don't think it works very well. The bottom line is the handsets aren't really fully ready for this new 3G environment, uh, which is going, basically going to be pocket-sized gadgets which play a lot of it. Is it going to come? Is it going to be needed? Absolutely. Is it too early? I think Hutch is uh, basically a pioneer. They've got the arrows in the back. Um, which discussed, and Duncan has discussed uh, a little bit about the uh, mobile handset market. Essentially, as I see it, global handset manufacturers are going up. The, uh, the foreign handset manufacturers are going down. They don't want to admit it. It's reality. Um, uh, but the situation, I, I don't see getting any better. I, I think that they could have 80% of the whole market by 2005 or 6. Um, uh, mostly CDMA, mostly GSM, 93%. CMA only 6.5%. 6. It's a crowded handset market. There are 31 um, uh, licensed for GSM slash GPRS handsets. And as I mentioned, the situation. Uh, Nimble Bird, largest domestic handset manufacturer. Um, some of the other major players, not quite household names in America or Europe yet, right? Will they be? I think they need a little, a little bit of a little bit better marketing between you and I. Uh, domestic handset. It makes sense for all these players who are doing headsets to start with the CMA, CMA production because I think you can see that our future around the world for wireless communications and handsets is CMA. No denying CMA technology. So by manufacturing 2G CMA handsets, most of the players um, can get ramp up for the. 3G handsets uh, as they come up. Again, 37 players in the market. Huawei has announced that they will enter with CDMA handsets into the market. Um, currently, 37 handset manufacturers. I believe there's going to be a shakeup. How can you manufacture without profit? Uh, I, I don't. I don't see. I think that there'll be consolidation. Um, this is my evolution of the mobile handset um, um, industry as I see it. The Western, the Japanese, the European handset manufacturers, they go to Taiwan, they get most of these OEM and ODM. BenQ happens to be an OBM as well, they, but they produce from Motorola. Um, all these um, handset manufacturers, also notebook manufacturers, big ticket item manufacturers, they work with them and they take the designs into China, typically with Taiwanese, or they also cooperate with Chinese handset Chinese factories to produce these handsets in China. I believe this is the evolution. What I see is that uh, Taiwan will design, um, they'll be mass produced in China. Uh, you'll see the situation with, with dual branding. Uh, the, carrier's hand, the carrier's name will be on the handset, as will the manufacturer. Right now, the carriers are gone. What they say, the handset manufacturers must do. Because the situation is, these, this is a commoditized industry right now, and the manufacturers um, like Nokia and Motorola, didn't want to listen to the carriers in the United States. So guess what? For the past two years, they've not been selling their headsets, CMA headsets, very well in, in the American market. Now they've realized, they've become a little bit more humble, and they, uh, they listen to the carriers with what the carriers want uh, for these mobile devices. And now they're re-entering the market, and especially uh, Nokia is re-entering the market with kind of low-end CMA handsets, but they are re-entering the market. Um, look to basically carriers, um, uh, by 2005, the domestic handset man manufacturers could own 80% of the market. I mentioned, but um, I think Western handset uh, vendors will have no choice but to invest in, in the local firms. That's my, my humble opinion. Um, this is um, 
uh, Unicom strategy. Actually, I want to go back to the last slide. What I mentioned before is the situation where I see evolving Nike cell phones, Pepsi Cola cell phones. I see this as a very interesting strategy. Um, um, what is it? Uh, Honda, um, Toyota cell phones. I, I see this as a way for the handset manufacturers to work with so many multi-tier vendors to promote their cell phones in the global market. Right now you see the Japanese, Korean, and uh, Chinese pop singers promoting these cell phones. Soccer players in China promoting cell phones. Uh, this is just another, uh, another way to, to develop the market for these mobile devices. Um, Xiaolin Tong, we talked very quickly about it. It's very interesting to note, though, that, um, uh, well, this is a 32, I think Dr. mentioned 35 million. Uh, but the situation is, there's a migration path here. There's a UT Starcom has recently announced a migration based on TDSC domain. I would think I would put my money on uh, UT Starcom. Seems like a pretty savvy, savvy company. Um, I want to talk real quickly about the, um, the subtle of doing business with the Chinese. Uh, working in the Chinese environment is very, very complex. Understanding the Chinese people is very, very complex. This is not an easy culture to understand. And uh, it's critical, critical to understand that um, uh, you need to expect the unexpected when you do business with the Chinese in China. Uh, if you understand that, then you're, you're, you'll be, uh, it'll be a better business environment for when you interface with the Chinese counterparts. Uh, basically, there are a lot of things influencing China right now. Um, Americans are influencing China. The mobile device is influencing China. This fellow is influencing China. Um, there are a lot of things influencing China right now. Uh, these are all very good for China. The Chinese circle of influence. Jiaren, Shouren, Moshangren, basically family, friends, strangers. The Chinese family unit is incredibly strong. Much stronger than here in the West. You cannot break the Chinese family unit. You simply can't. So how do you get into the, how do you penetrate the veneer of the Chinese my, uh, the Chinese um, uh, circle of influence. Basically, the Chinese view things as having continuity. This is why they want males and uh, sons instead of daughters. The name, Chinese name, it's the continuation of the bloodline. It's the continuity of the culture. When people, when the Chinese ask you a question, they don't directly get to the target. They use a, a subtle approach, which is the way the Chinese do things when they interface in a, in a business and even a personal sense. So they are trying to get to the target, but they're using a subtle approach to do that. Confucian, Confucianism and how it applies to, biz, to business in China, um, facing Guanxi, of course, is very, very critical, uh, very, very important. Um, it is important to also note, though, in China, there's a hierarchical thing with um, hierarchy in the uh, state run and even the, the large organizations. It's, the Chinese people have a lot of creativity. They have a lot of creativity and they have a lot of individuality. individuality. But however, in the group, when you are, um, when you stick up uh, like the nail, you're going to get pounded down. And that is the situation. Um, I want to just focus a little bit about the relationship um, of, of, law, of laws and contracts. Relationships are, are emphasized, but I want to focus on uh, the relationship versus goal orientation. Uh, comparison, the East and the West, it's the mindset, essentially. And uh, in, the, in the East, the relationship evolves from understanding and trust, which will lead to a goal and a task. It's very different than things here in the West. Very, very different. In the West, a task evolves from an understanding and trust and eventually a relationship. So in the West, we're not going to develop a strong relationship with somebody um, first. We're going to, you know, we do the business. Eventually, if we like that person, we eventually become closer. But in the Chinese world, in the Chinese mindset, it's totally different. They would never try to engage in a person if they didn't like them. They won't engage in a person who's trying to make them lose face. They will only engage in a person to build the relationship up um, if they like that person, if they can communicate and deal with that person. And then, then there may be maybe a quid pro quo where you know he, he may ask you for something, you may ask him for something. It's developing guanxi and buying a store. It's something that develops in a social context, and you don't always develop. Sometimes you, you can develop it, sometimes you cannot. Face, means basically, 
it's, uh, it's mighty critical to develop the face and keep the face of your counterparts, counterparts in China. Never make a Chinese person lose face. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. I can tell you from personal experience, if you make a Chinese person lose face, you do not, you will not have that uh, person as a friend. Uh, in the business environment, and in the business sense, if you make Chinese people lose face in a public situation, or even in the family, um, a lot of repercussions. You could probably not be able to do business with, in, in a business sense with that person. And I know you're, you're smiling, but I don't know if you agree with that. Um, guan Xi, Guan, Close, Xi system. Put them all together, what do you have? You've got a closed system. So how do you open the door to this closed system? Very, very difficult. Um, but developing Guan Xi is the way to do that. It must be done in, in a, it can be done in a social, uh, environment it can be done in many, many different ways, but building Guan Xi in China is very, very crit critical. It's essentially currency. It's currency. And the Chinese use it, and savvy Americans or, or Europeans, like Duncan, use it as well in China uh, to his advantage and to their advantage. Understanding China's legal environment and contracts. You know what? When you sign a contract with the Chinese, you're only starting the ballgame. In America, we say you still have nine innings to go. Because when you sign a contract with the Chinese, things will change, and things do change, and it's to the, uh, the detriment of the Western company signing the contract, to the advantage of the Chinese uh, organization or company uh, signing the contract, that uh, things will change to, to tailor and suit the Chinese needs. It's not a black and white situation. Um, so a written contract is really just a, a roadmap. It's a roadmap for continued cooperation, granted that both parties like to do business with each other, because if they don't like to do business with each other, they're not going to. I know a lot of this stuff may sound very mundane and simple. Sometimes uh, that's what's needed. Navigating China's uh, socialist system of red tape. You know, the Chinese invented bureaucracy. They also invented propaganda and persuasion. It's called the art of war. The Chinese have been using it in business. The Japanese adopted the art of war to do business in Japan. But it comes from China. The art of war is 2,000 years old. And swings the Ming Fah in China. And the Chinese use this. And it's very successful. And MBA classes around the world, I believe, are adopting some of these strategies. So uh, this is just quickly about the Chinese people who work in the West. The Chinese people are amazing. The Chinese people are all over the world. But there's a glass ceiling, especially in America. Most Chinese people come to the West with technology degrees and science degrees. Some have realized that they do need to reinvent themselves. But it's very, very difficult because you have a glass ceiling situation. They can reinvent themselves. When they reinvent themselves, then they will continue to be successful. But that is the situation in the West, uh, and of course in corporate America. Corporate America has its share of politics, just like China. Um, adopting proven tactics and strategies for success in China. A roadmap is needed. You have to solve some of the problems that, have, that I have seen dealing with the West. Market blockers and uh, strategies and tactics. Now, um, <clears throat> That's pretty big nose, isn't it? That's maybe an exaggeration, but the bottom line, as you can see, there's a communication mix up here. Um, so Western companies are weak at developing long-term relationships due to lack of social contact, uh, inexperience with dealing with Asian cross cultures. We have Japanese, Chinese, Korean, Indonesian, Malaysian. Um, they, they don't have a strong corporate identity system. They don't realize that when you go into China, the Chinese are very brand conscious. So when you take your product into China, not only do you have to have an English logo and an in English um, uh, strategy for developing who you are in that market, you must have a Chinese strategy as well. And uh, Microsoft uh, in Chinese, Wei Ran. Chinese people don't say Microsoft. Well. They say Wei Ran, Wei Ran in China. They know what it means. Click o you know. Coca-Cola. So, as a new organization, small, medium startup, startup company, you can use this strategy, and you should use this strategy to enter the Chinese market. Um, no language support, no local language product literature, which is important. Put it on your website, create a website with this support, even if it's a few pages. Um, you know, you can't just find a distributor in China and say, okay, all, all your problems are now over, because you can find bad distributors in China. Ones that will hurt your reputation, even the reputation, the reputation you've spent a long time developing can be hurt by a bad distributor, an unethical distributor. Sounds like an oxymoron. Um, anyway, 
Uh, no product literature localization strategies. If you don't localize the product to the Chinese market, it's very difficult to sell to the Chinese market. And a lot of Western companies, they fix the price to the US standard. How can you in China? There are different needs and different demands. When you go into China as a Western manufacturer and you want to sell your product, you're going to listen to what the supplier wants from, from the product. You now have to take that back into the West and translate that to your engineers and your product managers back in corporate. Sometimes it, there's something that gets lost between what the needs are in China and what the American company is willing to do back in the West. So the person who sells into the Chinese market essentially has to act as a bridge. He must act as a very, very important bridge. This is just a roadmap for action for small, medium-sized organizations. Big organizations have the big, deep pockets. They can, they can afford to do a lot more in China. When you're a small, medium-sized organization and you don't have an office in China, how do you start? These are some of the strategies that I've used in the past uh, in order to do that. Defining the market and blockers. So there are a lot of blockers in the mobile, in the mobile ants industry. Quite a lot. There are a lot of manufacturers and they're producing these mobile devices. And there's a standard working, standards working group. Uh, and in year 2002, they wanted, to they wanted to impose the world's toughest mobile phone radiation standard. But then they, they backed off. But the bottom line is the Chinese are very concerned about all these mobile devices. There's something called SAR, which is the rate we call it specific absorption rate, which is the radiation that emits from the antenna. And the Chinese are very, very concerned about this. The standard in America in the West is 1.0. The Chinese wanted a 0.8 standard for radiation that emits from the mobile device. Uh, they're concerned, the Chinese are concerned. They're the largest market, the youth of their country are using the mobile devices. By the way, cell phones are not safe for you. In the cell phone, I've been wireless 10 years. I have no problem telling you that. I would use a Bluetooth device if I were you. I don't, I use, or use a wireless earpiece. I think there's a more behind the reason why the British government recently decided to make all cell phones uh, in cars. Um, you have to have a hands-free kit now, as of December, is that correct? Is that, is that right? I think there are a lot of reasons for that. I don't think it's one reason. Um, anyway, um, in terms of blockers, you've got, uh, the Chinese are very concerned about cyber war about cyber attacks to the networks. Uh, so if you're going to sell a product into the Chinese market, you need a letter saying you're not going to hack or um, allow hack, allow your programs are not going to allow hacking into the networks. Very, very serious situation. Um, a lot of companies have been, have been hacked. Um, very quickly, defining uh, the market and blockers. Uh, another issue here is the intellectual property. I think everybody realizes when you go to China, you're going to have some lawyers. You want to protect your IP. Make sure you register your logo, your trademark, your trademark, and your patent. If you're going in as a long-term player with technology, if you have no technology in the Chinese market, you're out of the ball game. If you lose your IP in the Chinese market, again, you're out of the ball game. End of the end of the game. So it's very, very important when you go into the Chinese market to understand it. I think the positive thing about this whole thing is that if you look at the Taiwanese, they've already become IP developers. I think China is, as you can see, emerging as a, as a uh, 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 the Chinese market is emerging as a place where they also develop IP. So uh, there's a lot of counterfeiting going on, but I think if you look at more, the more of the savvy companies, they've got tremendous R&D engineering talent now. They can develop this technology, and guess what? The Western manufacturers are investing heavily into China to do just that. Um, also, the currency exchange and market segmentation issues. I always tell people, if you don't develop multiple markets in China, it's very, very easy to lose the market very, very quickly. Because your biggest competitors in China will be who? Will be Chinese companies. Those will be your biggest competitors. Um, why develop your China market strategy? Timing is critical right now. With China being the largest, most subscriber market in the world, China is the, really the market you should focus your attention on uh, if you're savvy with doing international business as a small and medium-sized company, especially in the mobile device industry. Focus on that market right now. If you have a piece of hardware, if you have a piece of software, if you have a little Hello Kitty knickknack that hangs, that hangs off the mobile device, guess what? You can make money in China, but you need to focus your strategies and invest in the long term for this Chinese market. Um, 
Okay, we move on. We're almost at the end here. So how do you develop this YT? How do you develop it? How do you do that? Well, there are a bunch of trade shows that you can start as a small and medium-sized enterprise if you don't have the background doing that. You can go to these trade shows. It's a good idea to deal with the government. It's a good idea to deal with the universities. If you have a new piece of technology, you want everybody to know about it. You want to drive people to your website and to your company, to you. How do you do that? You do it in a social environment. You deal with the government. You deal with the, the various organizations in China. So there are ways to do it. Um, the Chinese say, Rome wasn't built in a day. The Great Wall wasn't built in a day. It's going to take a long time for you to develop your warranty with the Chinese people in a Chinese setting. Can it be done? Absolutely. It's being done every single day by foreign companies accessing and having successful business with China, with China and the Chinese market. Strategies for planning. Create a cost-effective strategy. China can be very, very expensive to invest in. Everybody looks at how, how cheap the labor is in China. Guess what? That's the only thing that's cheap in China. Try going to China for one week. You know how expensive it is to stay in a hotel. Western food, you think that's cheap in China? No. Um, so you need to have, you need to have cost-effective marketing strategies to enter the market. Marketing and selling expenses overhead to support that. By, but by all means, if you have this, if you're going to go into China, these are some strategies that can be deployed. Um, these are some of the Chinese names that I put together. Again, as I mentioned, your branding is very, very critical. The Chinese are really going for branding. They really like the little Hello Kitty um, face plates on these small devices, or the Winnie the Pooh, or again, diamonds on the front of the uh, front of the handset. Status them. Um, these are some of the um, again some of the logos I've created for the companies I've worked for. Um, Again, like I mentioned, Harley Davidson or Nike cell phones is going to be very popular. Multiple channel selling strategy. Okay, so you've gone into China. You can't communicate with China Mobile. They won't talk to you. China Unicorn won't talk to you. The handset manufacturers blow you off. What do you do? You go back. You give up. You simply do not. There are a lot of companies in China. A lot of Western companies in China. Everyone's digging in. And everybody wants to be there in the long term because they've all been told that it's a long term play. It is a long term play. And the way to deal, if you cannot deal with the carriers, or the ISPs, or the handset vendors, and you have a piece of software or hardware that you want to sell to the Chinese, is try to sell to the Western companies that are operating there. You might find them to be a little bit more open minded when dealing with you. Typically, the best way to do that, though, is to deal with the parent in the, outside of China to get the introduction to the Chinese manager, the Chinese country manager, um, and then develop the I have to develop your relationship. I have done that multiple times in getting contracts uh, in China. So basically, this is one selling strategy. This is a roadmap, just a, a very short roadmap for entering uh, for immediate steps that you can take. Uh, they've been mentioned some of these before. The next, of course, is the long term. Long-term strategy with entering the market. I tell people, um, on your, uh, open up your own fully for own enterprise. Because how great the Chinese people are, they still are a race of people that, um, that really uh, focus on control. They, they are controlling people. And when you're in the Chinese market as a woofy, you want more, more control of your enterprise. A lot of investment vehicles use joint venture in China, and that works for certain industries, certain companies, uh, and certain business situations. It doesn't work for every business situation. So um, as a small and medium-sized organization, you simply have more control when you register as a wholly foreign enterprise. You use Hong Kong shell companies to do that. You can do it cheap, you can do it expensive. You can do it quick, you can do it slow. Improving profitability, these are five ways that you can improve some of your profitability in China. So many companies have gone into China looking at the West as their competition and finally realizing that the Chinese companies are their competition. A lot of companies have been driven out of China because they misunderstood the competition from within. Uh, improving profitability, objectives. These are uh, 13 objectives that you would um, consider when going into the Chinese market. It's a small, medium-sized organization. Um, these are 
hourglass. This is not supposed to be an hourglass, but basically. Um, this is just an, uh, an example of uh, how successful Wolfies actually can be over a period of time when investing in China. Well, here's my conclusion, if I can get all of that. Okay. So China is the world's largest mobile subscriber market, and um, the market is growing rapidly. It's growing daily. These smartphones, converged devices, are needed in China, and China will play a role in the mobile lifestyles of people in China. The Chinese mobile handset players, they're gaining in technology, um, and market and international marketing expertise, but again, for the expertise on international marketing, I think it's the Toyota situation. It's when, you, when you're in Rome, you must do as the Romans. That means they need to hire Western people to access Western markets. Um, by virtue of size, China can influence markets, so don't, under, don't underestimate China's potential. That's the biggest problem that Western companies have, is underestimating the Chinese people and underestimating the Chinese companies. Finally, the mobile device is already changing the basic way people in China communicate, uh, and it's very different in the United States. I was over 30 when I bought my first cell phone. But you know, if you work in China, if you live in China, if you travel to China, you'll see 15-year-old kids with the funkiest new devices sending SMS messages in China. It is the end thing, and that's why the carriers are going after them, and that's why for the smartphone, a lot of it is being driven by the consumer market right now, where eventually it will be driven by the enterprise market. Uh, China's mobile digital dragon, it's setting its own wireless standards for 3G technology. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.